viruses that have ever struck human beings since the history of human beings. There are also other deadly hemorrhagic viruses. So it falls in a class of viruses called hemorrhagic viruses. So during the course of my presentation, I am going to go through all these slides the way they appear here. Next. So basically, Dr. Balejus had already mentioned this, that in 1976, there was a first outbreak of Ebola. And this happened in Zaire, then Zaire. You know that country now as uh, the Democratic uh, Republic of Congo. And it is spread to other countries. Within the same year, there was an outbreak in Sudan. And again, it's repeated in another part of Sudan, like that. And all these outbreaks have been documented. Going on. Of particular interest is Uganda. And I particularly mentioned this as opposed to the one of 2005 because this was the most deadly uh, attack that we had. But the virus that hit Guru was called Ebola Sudan because of its origin. But in 2005, 2007, we had another attack which was eventually named Ebola Uganda. And the nomenclature or the naming of these viruses follows their origin. And the virus itself was called Ebola because it was first discovered along River Ebola in Zaire. So if you see in terms of geographical distribution, the virus actually is concentrated in this area, the coastal part, and then Zaire, then Uganda, and then it skips all other countries and comes and concentrates in the West African region. At the moment, they are spread to all those countries up to somewhere there. I over the course up to uh, Guinea Bissau. Continue. So basically, in terms of prevention, that's what I'm supposed to concentrate on. You should know what are the risky exposures that potentially cause disease or infection in human beings. And there are three modes of infection through the unsterilized uh, needles, suboptimal postural conditions, and personal contact. Now, looking at this, we are able to do prevention for each one of these. For instance, use of unsterilized needles, that one is almost sorted. However, one of the scientists who had the unfortunate infection in the United States had a needle stick in the laboratory. So this is still a potential area of this uh, infection. And remember, when the patient comes, you need to investigate, remove samples, and means a treatment, and so on. So in the process, you can still have a needle stick injured. Then, if Ebola is in an environment where there is congestion, that's a suboptimal condition. So it can transmit from person uh, to another person through contact. Tomorrow. It has been known that in non-human primates, particularly monkeys, this virus also affects uh, such non-human primates. And in Uganda, the attack, particularly the attack of 2005 to 2007, was linked to the monkeys. And the people who first died of the disease had actually eaten monkeys in the western part of Uganda. Now, looking at this, they have tried to sort or trace back the virus to the monkeys, and they have found that the monkeys also tend to be a transient vector, a vector, and not the real source. So the real source of the virus is not yet known up to now. It could actually be a virus that stays in the soil. Okay, move on. Yes, this we have already talked about it, move on. Yes, so I wanted to uh, continue telling you that this seems to be a limited infection within African region. And talk about the African Union, it's again within the Sub-Saharan Africa. You don't get Ebola in China. You don't get Ebola in, in the, yeah, South Africa, you talk about it. You don't get Ebola in Europe. And a few attacks that have happened in the United States have been very, very limited. And the outcome is definitely very different. Ebola Sudan, Ebola Zaire are very, very deadly. Mortality goes up to between 80 to 100%. The Ebola Uganda, the mortality is very low, about 30%. The one that affected Gulu was named 
Ebola Sudan and the mortality was 53 percent. <laughs> yes, one of the things that we have to be very careful about is the potential of a hemorrhagic virus like Ebola to be used by terrorists. And people have to be aware of this. Because a terrorist can just get a blood sample and smear it on a bus, and whoever sits in there gets in contact with it. This has happened, uh, bioterrorism has happened with the anthrax. It's now posted in the letters, but for public health uh, aspects, this can easily happen. And remember, this virus has a potential of living outside the human body for a long time. Yes, go on. Uh, yes. So just to say, when somebody gets the exposure, what does happen to a person? One, within 48 hours to one week, somebody gets an onset of fever which is non-remittent. In other words, the fever begins and it continues and doesn't stop. That's, that usually is the first symptom. And then somebody goes through a phase of intense weakness of the body. And so somebody is lethargic. And then somebody complains of severe muscle pains. Headache almost similar to that of meningitis does occur. A sore throat, vomiting everything that somebody has, and diarrhea, usually dysentery. And somebody goes into impaired kidney and liver function. So you get somebody swollen and bleeding from all over the place. Continue. Yes. Remember, my talk is not on that. Somebody is going to talk about that. My talk is on prevention. So is there a cure? Let's begin from a cure. There is no known cure for Ebola up to now. Medical cure. Remember, I'm talking about medical cure. Yes. Now, there have been some advances in terms of prevention if uh, you particularly talk about use of uh, vaccines. Uh, next. In 2005, Two doctors, one from Canada, a place called Winnipeg, that's uh, Dr. Hayes, and one called uh, Thomas from Maryland in the US, successfully vaccinated monkeys. The only problem with this vaccine is that it is against one strain. That's Ebola Zaire. Ebola Zaire. And this is not good news. Because, for instance, you can now, not now use this vaccine to prevent Ebola Uganda. You see the point? It is a strain-specific vaccine. And so it is very limited. So even when there is such, we find it very difficult to expand the use of such a virus because Ebola virus has so many strains. I've already named a number of them. So vaccine is not the mainstay of prevention, but looking after but looking after, okay, you just go back. Looking after sources of contact, use of contaminated uh, material, including injections, body fluids. Avoiding body fluids tends to be one of the main uh, stay of prevention, and isolating everyone who has got in contact with uh, a person. There are also other guidelines that have come up, including travel guidelines, particularly when you are traveling to and outside a place which is an epicenter for an outbreak. For instance, if you are now going to any of these affected countries in West Africa, once you get in there, you are in a risky country because there is a red flag in those countries. Now, when you come out of there, if you exhibit any of those signs, you are somebody to be quarantined so that you don't expose other people to the virus. So that seems to be the mainstay at the moment. Now what about somebody? Remember, the attack that I've quoted about, the one of 2000 and 2001, it killed 53%. What about the 47%? So what are you going to do with them? So there are three things that do happen there in terms of prevention. First of all, Health workers tend to mitigate the complications of Ebola. So those patients go through treatment. Two, 
there is a strong recommendation that there should be no sexual intercourse for a minimum of three months after the cover because the virus logs onto semen. So that's another preventive strategy in medicine. And then three, somebody should stay under quarantine for 42 days after the last episode of fever. Then thereafter, somebody can start interacting. Now, there have been theories that it can be transmitted through food, and so that has not been proven. It is through contact with uh, an infected person. That's the main thing. So I wanted just to go and um, uh, do conclusions here. Even when we have that breakthrough of that vaccine, the mainstay of prevention tends to be avoiding contact, by and large, contact with an infected person. Now, I wanted you to uh, give some references for those who would like to check on this. A lot of materials available if you went to the internet, you get a lot of material, but there are some volumes there, particularly after the outbreak of 2005. Uh, Ebola, um, back to 2005, you get a lot of uh, material on Ebola. Thank you very much, Chairman. Yeah.